right, thanks for coming, everybody. This is the last talk of AltConf before the uh, James Dempsey breakdown, so thanks for uh, coming here to spend it with me. Um, who here, just on a show of hands, has ever had a bug in an app with dates and times? That's as many people as I thought, yeah. Um, so this is gonna be uh, a talk with a few different parts. We're gonna do a little bit of talking about why those bugs happen, uh, a little bit of examples of how to get around them, uh, but mostly it's gonna be about strategies to avoid having those problems. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing iOS for about 10 years now. Uh, I came to WWDC 2008 and all these new APIs that sounded really cool. Um, recently though, I've been doing more uh, web stuff with TypeScript, and um, spoiler alert, uh, date and time issues still show up uh, no matter what platform you're on. Um, we're actually gonna look at some of the things I've been doing on the web regarding date and time too. Um, as I mentioned, I wrote these two books. Uh, this is my first one, Don't Buy It, it's super out of date, it's like iOS 5. Uh, this is the second one, also don't buy that, uh, it's watchOS 2. Uh, so they're all very out of date. Um, and the reason that I bring all this up is not to sit here and brag, not to say like, oh, I've been here forever, so I know everything. Uh, the reason is because I still have issues with dates and times. Um, it's a thing that I've been working on for a long time. I gave a talk at AltConf in 2014 about dates and times. Um, that was really exciting because I managed to get some Swift on my slides a few days after it was introduced. Um, and yet, the closer you look at date and time problems, the more problems you get. It's like a fractal of, uh, of bad problems. Um, so I've given two previous talks on this. Um, I'll push uh, these slides to my blogs, and this will be uh, actually links you can click on to watch them. But I wanna give a quick recap of some of the standard concepts. Um, so date the date class. First off, one of the big problems is the name of the date class. When you say date, you have this baggage because we all know how to read clocks. We all know what a calendar is. But a date is actually just a moment in time, just an instant. Um, when you do PO on a date, what you see though is you see a year, you see a month, you see a day, you see a time. And sure, it gives it to you in UTC, uh, but that is actually way more information than a date has. What you should really look at is the next line, where it gives you that time interval since a reference date. That's the number of seconds since the arbitrary date that we start with, which I think is January 2001. So a lot of people struggle with this. Uh, they'll say, um, I entered the date in uh, Pacific time. You actually didn't. What you actually did was you put in this moment in time. And we'll get back to that later. Um, the biggest thing is formatters. Uh, if you've been doing this for a while and you're only familiar with NS date formatter, uh, since early versions of iOS, Apple has added a lot more specialized formatters. Uh, that can make the hard things really hard. So you never wanna get in a position where you're manually trying to format dates or times because um, it's always gonna throw you for a loop. So we're gonna start out uh, looking at some of the ways that you can use formatters to make the, your life easier. Also gonna do this in Xcode 10. Um, so I've heard it's very stable. We will find out together. All right, how's that uh, text size for everyone in the back? Is that good? Cool. All right, let me just get my code all set up. So, let's look at this talk that I'm doing right now. Uh, the time zone that we're in right now, I'm gonna use the America Los Angeles identifier to say that we're in um, Pacific time. 
And I always like to use the identifiers with the city whenever possible. Uh, because right now, raise your hand if you think we're in PST. Ah, we're in PDT right now. And I always forget which is which. But if you use the city, you don't have to know. Um, you also don't have to know if you're in a place that supports daylight saving time. Uh, Arizona, I don't think the entire state does. So uh, what I've done here is I've got these two date components objects. They both use the time zone and have all the information that I care about for this talk. It starts at 2 o'clock. It ends at 2.45. Now I've got this calendar. Um, the auto-updating current calendar is probably the one you want to use most of the time because what you want to do is show the user in their time zone wherever they are. If you use the auto-updating calendar and your user's on a plane and they get off another time zone, everything should be fine. So when I want to display this, let's grab a simple date, for, uh, date interval formatter. Um, one of my favorite classes that Apple has added is called date interval. And it's basically uh, a start and an end date, or you can give it a start date and a duration. And when you do that, now you can use this date interval formatter. And if I run, it gives us this nice string, 2 o'clock to 2.45 p.m. And the interesting thing about date interval formatter is that it knows when certain parts of the string need to be different. So if I come up here and I change the hour, let's say to 10. So let's say this is more of a workshop-like talk and we're gonna be here a while. Well, now it gives us 10 a.m. to 2.45 p.m. Because a.m. and p.m. are different now, it knows to give us those different values. And the same thing for the date. So if you uh, allow it to use the date, it's just gonna say 6, 7, 18. If, the, if that event spans multiple days, uh, then you would get both of them in there. So that's cool. Um, but one thing that people always want to do is relative date formatting. So if you're in an email client, you want that to say today. And there are libraries on GitHub uh, that can do that. Um, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to write the entire formatting system yourself. Uh, you're going to get something wrong, and then you're going to want to support a new language or a new locale, and it's going to be a lot of work. So instead, we can kind of meet the system halfway. There are, on a calendar, some convenience methods. Uh, is date in today? Is date in tomorrow? Is date in yesterday? So now we only want to worry about those three days to give them a prefix on that string. So if it's today, tomorrow, or yesterday, we'll set a prefix. Uh, otherwise, we'll just let the formatter use the date style of short. And now, if I add that string to our prefix, we'll get today, 2 o'clock to 2.45 p.m. So in that way, uh, you can automatically, let's say you're writing an app for a conference, which is, oh. Yeah. How's that? Um, so like I was saying, um, one of the canonical examples that you get at a conference because it's on everyone's mind is like a conference schedule app. Uh, so this would be a strategy for showing when a session is. You didn't write the entire thing from scratch, you just customized it a little bit to make it work for your needs. All right. We're going to get into the main part of this talk, and there's two main parts. The first is problems that have solutions. Uh, so you can guess as to what's coming next. Um, the previous example, that was the first case. There's an obvious solution for formatting dates, right? It's a thing you can solve. Um, this is the state of Indiana. Every different color is a different time zone. And when I say time zone, what I mean is, and this is one of my favorite phrases from uh, Apple's documentation, it's a geopolitical region. And there's two important parts there. The, the geo part that we all get, places are in different areas, the sun comes up different times, that's why we have time zones. But the political part is more important. 
because like any other law, time zones are messy. Um, and I don't have it on a slide in this talk, but I was in Indianapolis watching a friend run the Indy Marathon, and we happened upon a protest. People were protesting the time zones because they wanted Indiana to be on central time, the whole thing. Um, and that's all well and good. But if you're writing an app, let's say, uh, that has to do with physical locations, and those physical locations have hours, and your user is in a different time zone, it gets very complicated very fast. Um, this is Antarctica. And the way that we've decided to divide up Antarctica is um, basically draw a line from part of it to the country that first settled it, or not settled it, but you know, whatever country supplies that part of Antarctica is what sets the time zone. So here we go from uh, four or six hours before UTC to uh, 13 hours after. So there's a 19 hour difference in the time zones um, on places that are not that far from each other. So it gets complicated. So let's go back to the code. did not actually copy when I said copy. Okay. Um, there's a few different ways you can make time zones. The first one is by using um, seconds from GMT. So every time zone has an offset. Um, but you'll notice if I ask that time zone when the next daylight saving time transition is, it doesn't know. Right, because there are places in these time zones that just don't support daylight saving time. So just knowing the offset is not enough to know whether or not daylight saving time is a thing wherever you're concerned with. By the way, it's daylight saving time, and uh, I'm probably going to mess that up. So uh, what other ways do we have? You've already seen uh, the, let's get that here the way to do it with a city name. And like I said, this is my preferred way. So um, I'm from Detroit, obviously, because I work at Detroit Labs. And oops, our next uh, daylight saving time transition is November 3rd, 2018 at 11 p.m. Does that seem right to everybody? So these are subtle things that happen with a debugger because right now my Mac is set to Pacific time. And so this next daylight saving time transition, that gives you a date. I don't know how readable that is, but it gives you a date, an optional date. Um, but when Xcode goes to format that to display in the playground, it's giving it to me in my local time on my Mac. Um, and this again is like the source of many confusing moments. Uh, because you will look at that and say, well, that's not right. I know it happens at 1 a.m. And it does, but it happens at 1 a.m. there. Um, so just another thing to keep in mind. Now, there's one more way to get a time zone. And that's through an abbreviation. So I know right now Detroit is in Eastern Daylight Time. And that's actually going to give me back the New York time zone, because that's the default time zone for uh, Eastern. And that's going to have all the same uh, uh, pitfalls as any time zone, where uh, I can say EDT, but if I'm in a place uh, that is Eastern time, and let's go to Eastern Standard Time. See what that, what that's different. Because obviously if it's Eastern Daylight Time, you would know it supports daylight saving time. But if you're in a time zone that maybe does, maybe doesn't support daylight saving time, you can't assume that. So you need to be very, very careful with time zones. So I mentioned this in the problems with solutions uh, category. So um, you'd probably like a solution for this. Uh, the solution here, whenever you can, um, use the city or the closest city um, there's a lot of APIs out there, so 
Google has a Maps API that will give you the uh, time zone for a, a location, and it returns multiple types. It gives you the offset, it gives you the time zone itself, and it gives you the identifier, which is the city. Always use that identifier. Next up, uh, here's another common problem. Uh, it seems that every few years, uh, around daylight saving time transitions, um, some apps have problems with that. Has anyone here ever gotten a notification at the wrong time because of that? That's actually um, one of the more benign uh, daylight saving time issues or time zone issues. Um, I won't name names, but before I had my Apple Watch, I had another fitness tracker, and I was on a flight. I was about halfway back from, it was an international flight, about halfway back, and the app gave me an alert, and it said, hey, um, your time zone changed, so we've discarded all of today's data. Um, it's not the best way to solve that problem. It's a way, it's not the best. Um, instead, let's talk about a different approach to uh, figuring out when something will happen. So for this example, we want to show uh, a Happy New Year notification for our user. So I'm gonna copy this and bring that over here. Okay, so once again, I've got these date components and there's all these different parts of a date uh, that you can set and here, I just care that it's January 1st at midnight. That's when you say Happy New Year. Okay, and there's a bunch of can import stuff. So I'm just gonna get this whole blob because they added some more notifications in um, Mac OS Mojave, which made Xcode really angry with me. So uh, user notifications and playground support are what we're gonna use for this, but uh, with the user notifications framework, there's these, this concept of a trigger, which is when you want the notification to happen. And there's a few different ones you can do. I think there's a geolocation one. The one we care about now is um, when a date matches these components. And we want it to repeat because we want to say Happy New Year every year. Now I can ask that trigger. In fact, let's ask that trigger. for its next date, and I'm not sure why Xcode isn't running in here, but I think I set this to be an iOS playground, so let's try getting rid of that. See if it yells at me again. Okay, hang on, we've got an if. Yeah. Yeah. I did want that because if we don't have that, I didn't want to do any of this code, but this should work for now. So, come on, Xcode test. There we go, cool. So, uh, the next time this is gonna happen is January 1st, 2019 at 12 a.m. And as we already know, because this is a date, that's my max local time. So right now, that's gonna happen in Pacific time. And the nice thing about these triggers is that as the user moves through time zones, that will change because all we told the system we care about is that it's cool. And okay. I have switched to Xcode 9. Let's see if that helps. Anyway, so it's giving us the right date. And that's a strategy that you can also use yourself in code. There's another method on calendar, next date after. So we can say, after right now, when is the next date in this calendar that matches those components that I set? 
Um, now this is a lot better than trying to do this manually and create a date. Um, does anybody know about daylight saving time in Brazil? So this is one of my favorite uh, oddities in the world. Brazil does their time change at midnight. So it goes from 11.59 and 59 seconds to 1 a.m. So if what you're trying to do is uh, create a date that's midnight in Brazil on that day that happens to be the day they change the daylight saving time, which they just changed, by the way, then you actually don't get midnight. One of two things happens. You get nil or you get 1 a.m. And you're probably not expecting either of those things. But when you do this matching, you're going to get the next date. Um, you can get, have it do next time. So uh, this is a really powerful way uh, to get those things. So we'll fill a Happy New Year thing, give a notification request, and that's not really what the talk is about. So we'll skip to the end where, hey, uh, we were successful in our attempt to schedule that notification for our user. Sure. <laughs> uh, let's go back. Okay, so um, that's the happy part of the talk. That's the easy stuff. Let's talk about what happens if there's no right answer. This is one that has been a big debate in the office before. It's 11.55 p.m. The user says, in 15 minutes, remind me to go to bed. But there's a leap second. So what's the right answer? Did they mean they wanted a duration of exactly 15 minutes? Or were they expecting the time to go off at 12.10? Now this is a silly example because it doesn't really matter for our users one second difference in when an alarm goes off. Um, but it's the kind of question where you realize that our language about dates and times comes with a lot of ambiguity in it. Um, so what I've been doing for about the past year is I've been working on uh, a web app. I've been using TypeScript. I've been writing uh, Postgres database queries. Not a whole lot of iOS. And it turns out the problems are pretty much identical uh, in the domain. And I want to show some of the things I've been working on. So we've got these graphs. It's a, it's a big uh, enterprise web app I'm working on. And this, this graph, it has daily values over the course of a year. Except it also has daily values for the previous year. So you can compare how you're doing one year to the next. And we're looking at 2017 right now. Anybody guess the problem? Yeah, 2016 had an extra day. So what do you do with that extra day? And we went back and forth with the client about what the right answer was here. Either you can try to have two different uh, x axes that are slightly different, so days don't quite line up. Didn't seem right. Uh, or you could omit February 29th, but if that day was a big outlier, you want to see that data. Um, it's especially complicated by the fact that we have these um, tooltips. When you mouse over the graph, you see the individual values for that day. So the solution we went with was we put a gap in 2017. And then when you mouse over, when you see that gap and you mouse over it, hopefully the tooltip telling you that it's February 29th will be enough to say, oh, right, there was no 2017 of that year. Um, but that might not be the right solution for every app. Uh, if you're not caring about individual values, you're just caring about seeing the line, it might be the right thing to do to uh, remove the 29th. That's why this is, um, this is in the problems without solutions category, because it turns out that a lot of date and time issues aren't code level, they aren't framework level, um, they're people issues. It's what do you expect? What do you think is gonna happen? And when those expectations aren't met is when you have problems. Other graphs we have in here, month over month. Month over month is easy. We just go to the 29th. Same problem, right? We're looking at February 2017. We have the previous year's uh, February in there. It's pretty obvious to everybody what's happening here. But then we get to week. Um, one of the things you can do in date components is you can specify year of week. Uh, and there was a famous uh, issue, I think it might have been the Android Twitter client. In the last week of December, all of a sudden stopped working. Uh, does anybody remember this from seeing people laugh about it on Twitter? 
And the reason that happened was because they used the wrong format specifier for their year, and they actually did the year four week in year. So uh, because that week ended in January of the next year, the year had already moved to the next year, and their request had the wrong year in it, and everything failed. And what we came up with uh, as a problem here is a naive implementation of looking at a weekly graph. Uh, you would start on June 3rd for this year, and you want to show last year that week. Well, what does that mean, last year that week? If you just go back to June 3rd, 2017, that's not a Sunday. What you actually have to do is figure out, okay, what is this, like the 20th week this year? Let's go back and show the 20th week last year. Because then, if you have different values, let's say these are values for a place that isn't open on Sundays, you want to make sure that those peaks and valleys throughout the week line up. All right, so that's uh, a lot of the fun I've been having with graphing things for this enterprise app. And every time I bring up date and time issues, the client just says, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so the database we're using is Postgres, um, but this is all standard SQL stuff. Um, and of course, like with any good enterprise app, there are multiple third-party vendors at play here. And one of them is the people who are responsible for moving data from these systems to this system over here. And they always say, because this, this data uh, corresponds to individual physical locations, and they said, we enter the timestamps in the location's time zone. Hmm. So what they do is they have this timestamp here in SQL. And that looks like a pretty good time, like probably when this talk ends. Um, and Postgres, it has a different data type here. There's timestamp, and there's timestamp with time zone. This is the former. So, because now at this point we're all seasoned developers and we know about dates and times, we know this is just an actual moment in time, and there's no time zone information, so of course this is going to be UTC, right? I looked at the Postgres documentation. And what happens, when there's no timestamp, it interprets all, uh, when there's no time zone, sorry, it interprets all timestamps as happening uh, in the local time. Well, whose local time? The local time of the machine that's making the database query. So our servers are in Detroit, that means everything is in Eastern time. Um, that's really cool, yeah, so. There's, of course, a timestamp at time zone thing. So you can take that timestamp from the database and you can say, hey, actually, that timestamp was in Pacific time. So then, cool, it'll do the right thing. And uh, this seems like it would just work, right? We could just use this because we can find the, the time zone for that location. Um, and if you're paying attention to which part of the talk this is in, no. So that, this data has already been entered, right? We've already uh, lost something that we can't get back. A lot of these locations are open 24 hours. And what happens when we fall back in the fall? We repeat time. So right now, there are timestamps in the database that say 2.05 a.m. on this Sunday in November. And there's no way for me to know which 2.05 a.m. Was that 2.05 Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Time? Um, so uh, as far as this particular app, we're screwed. But uh, in the future, <laughs> the big takeaway, uh, the whole reason I'm talking about Postgres at an iOS conference uh, is because the solution is the same across any platform is to always, always, always store timestamps in UTC and if you have it, great, store the time zone information, but every timestamp needs to be UTC or you're gonna run into issues like this. Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes. We're gonna go and we're gonna have a little bit more fun. Um, does anybody here have a ticket for uh, actual dub dub? No, okay. Uh, well, the, um, the, the band tonight is Panic at the Disco. And um, yesterday I was at the Mac Rumors Mixer and I was talking uh, to a developer who had a ticket and she wasn't aware yet that it was Panic at the Disco. And I, at the moment I was talking about it, I also discovered she was a huge Panic at the Disco fan. 
Um, and there's a thing that happens where like the music that you listen to when you were younger is kind of always like the music that you like, you know, as you get older, you still like to listen to it. And when I was younger, I was really angsty and I listened to a lot of metal. So I was really delighted when uh, my coworker, Jenny, um, started a podcast. And the podcast is called The Roach Coach. Uh, they're at, with the K, of course. So they're attempting to make a timeline, a canon of, um, of new metal. I gotta get back to my uh, code that I had. It was Xcode crashed and I lost it. this one. Yes. Where's my mouse? There it is. All right. Sorry about those technical difficulties. This is the wrong playground. How about, there we go. All right, so. Give them the actual code that I want here. And I'm going to need to do this in Xcode 10. Sorry for the technical difficulties here. This is what happens when you try to use Xcode 10 uh, the week that it comes out. So I'll keep stalling while I wait for Xcode to load. So they separate uh, this timeline of, of new metal into a bunch of different areas. Which, and it, they, the analogy they use is that it's like a party. And like any good party, um, it starts with getting the party started, you're setting up the party before that, and before that you might be pre-gaming. So, come on Xcode. If it doesn't launch, it's fine, we'll just have to remove some of the, um, there we go. Okay. And I think I've lost the, uh, scratch pad playground where I was using, so that's fine, I'll just make a new one. Come on, Xcode. Okay, we're back in business. Except my presentation font. Okay, so let's make an enum. For all of the different uh, times in that timeline, so every album they review, what they do on this podcast is they review an album and they decide whether or not it makes it into the new metal canon. And as they do, they divide it into one of these time uh, frames. There's pre-gaming, setting up the party, getting the party started to the thick of it, and then uh, the come down, and then the hangover, and then finally, the reflective that was a great party section. And what I wanna do is I wanna write this. I want to write something that will, given a date, return the enum case that corresponds to that date. And I know the dates uh, for all these times, and I want to figure out the best way to figure that to uh, to write this method. So I could start writing, you know, if uh, date dot compare and give it, you know, some start date so on and so forth, else if, date dot compare, so on and so forth, and make this big, long if chain. Um, but I gotta believe there's a better way than that. So. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna give myself a little lookup table. So what it's gonna be is an array of tuples to map from a date interval to a case of this uh, enum. So we get a calendar. Now, what I really like about doing these talks is trivia. And with these date components, I can just, again, give the system the things I care about. So setting up the party started in 96, getting the party started in 97. This is gonna be tough. Does anybody wanna guess why uh, this date is when the thick of it starts. I'm alone, what's that? Uh, it's close. Uh, so that's the day Limp Biscuit's Significant Other came out. 
and it was a, a hallmark album of new metal. Uh, and then 9-11 happened, and that started the come down. So um, the thing is, you're going to notice that these start dates, what I really want is a date here, and I've given it date components. So I wrote a quick map that just uh, grabs a date from those components, and then uh, because everything before uh, setting up the party is just called pre-gaming, the entire history of time is just called pre-gaming, um, I'm using this distant past, and that's a static NS date value that just represents a long time ago. That's all you need to do, it's just a long time ago. Um, so I put that at the beginning. So now I have this array of when these things started. So I can go through and uh, with uh, Xcode 10, I can just do all cases because I made this a case iterable enum. So that's nice. And for all of these, I can grab the start date and I can grab the next start date. And if there is no next start date, just like there's distant past, I can use distant future. And then I can create this lookup table, which is this array that I can use. So now, if I want to know when in the timeline a specific date is, that code actually looks really nice. We grab that lookup table, and then we just iterate through it, and if the interval contains the date we're talking about, then that's the value that we return. Um, so again, I love date interval, and the contains uh, method is really nice. So now that I've done that, I can say new metal timeline uh, from date, give it the current date, and we can see that right now, we're in, that was a great party. And we can go a step further. And we can actually use a formatter to print out the entire timeline. So we can grab that same lookup table and we're gonna use compact map um, Compact map is the renamed version of flat map in Swift. Let me grab my formatter that I didn't copy. Uh, so I'm going to take all these time intervals. I'm going to turn them into strings. I'm going to join them with um, a new line separator. And just like that, we have a... Uh, the entire timeline printed out so we can check it out. So that's kind of a fun diversion. Um, but hopefully uh, some of these examples uh, will ring true in your head in the future when you have date and time issues, because you will. Uh, maybe you'll be able to solve them, maybe you won't. Um, there are a lot of good resources on this. So Apple has a date and time programming guide um, and then a former Apple employee who's now a snap, Dave DeLong, uh, wrote the website your calendrical fallacy is, uh, dot com, and that's just chock full of great examples of how common conceptions about calendars are wrong. Um, and he's also got a GitHub repo called Chronology, which is an attempt to uh, make an API around this that avoids problems, uh, like the name date is instead, I believe, instant in that library. Thank you for coming. Uh, if we have time, we can do uh, date and time questions. Thanks. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you did the relative dates in the beginning, mm -hmm. and you hard-coded the strings like yesterday and today. I did. Isn't that built into the uh, date formatters does relative date? Uh, yes, it's built into date formatters does relative date, but date interval formatter does not have does relative date. Fair enough, thank you. Yep. yep, and I should mention there's a pitfall with that. Um, when you go to localize that, um, you're gonna wanna put like today and then a token because some languages might reverse the order and put today at the end of that. So um, that particular example would need to be updated to work with an app that did have multiple language support. 
Hi, in department of nitpicky, nitpicky little things, but of course this talk was all about nitpicky little things. Mm -hmm. In your final example, I noticed that uh, the interval end date and the start date of the next interval were the same in each of those. So yes. um, in real life, uh, and not in a little coding example, how would you deal with that? Is it just a matter of deciding um, how you want to split up those dates and um, doing the appropriate coding or uh, does it kind of invalidate that whole method? Yeah, so that's, um, that's a good distinction to draw. I'll bring that code back up. Um, so you're talking about this one right here, right? Uh, where we use the start date of the next period as the end date of this period. Um, and the way the date interval works is like, um, it's like an open range, right? So the end date of an interval is not included in it, right? So that's like the first moment at which it stops being that interval. I've got a question about uh, the formatting of dates that are uh, like decimal, like 1.5 hours instead of one hour or two hours. Mm -hmm. I, I forget the name of that, um, that property, uh, but in the API it says that it's there, but it doesn't work. Um, yeah, uh, I have had issues with this too. So I think um, where I've seen it before is uh, a date component formatter. Um, that's another really useful formatter if you just want to format things like two hours, five minutes. Um, and this is allows fractional units property on that, right? So we can set that to true. And uh, let's give it some date components. Um, if you've never actually seen the full uh, date components initializer, it has everything you could want under there. Um, let's just do one and a half seconds. Oh, you're right. Okay. Let's do one second and uh, 50 nanoseconds. Why not? And then we're going to tell CF the allowed units to just be second. So I would expect this string to have a fractional second unit in it. And it just gives you one. Um, I don't know why, it's probably worth filing with Apple, uh, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, so um, like any date and time library, this is not perfect. Uh, Apple's is pretty good. Um, on the website, I'm using moment.js and it has its own weird indexing issues. Um, a lot of them are fundamentally written on the same lower level libraries. So once you get around the differences in syntax and naming, they should work similarly. Um, I'm not sure why this doesn't give us a fractional component. So I got another one. You brought up the curious case of Indiana, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and then you recommended uh, using tools such that you identified the closest city as a way to label the time zone. Do these databases of closest cities account for all of these little political jurisdictions or are you always going to be faced with some places where the uh, time zone is just going to be wrong because you can't specify it? So in an ideal situation, uh, what you would have, let's say you have a list of stores in Indiana, uh, your server would tell you which time zone those are in. Um, you never really want to be in a position to guess. If you have to guess, then instead of trying to find the closest city, that's where I would use like the Google Maps API where you can use the lat long and that'll, you know, Google pretty much knows what that's going to be. Uh, my favorite uh, solution to this has been China's. Um, all of China is just one time zone. They, they don't care. It, Sun rises at four over here, eight over here. Okay, that's fine. We're in one time zone. Yeah. Yeah, hi. I just had a question about uh, nanosecond timestamps in APFS. Um, <laughs> we're confronted to databases where there's a mix of nanosecond timestamps and all the timestamps which are not, uh, well, which are seconds based, 
are there any high-level APIs to handle that? Because we just hack around it by, you know, if it's larger than a certain value, then it must be nanoseconds. Yeah, so the, 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 the most you get out of the foundation API, um, everything's in terms of date components, right? So uh, as you just saw in that initializer, uh, nanosecond is an optional integer. So um, individual nanoseconds is as specific as these APIs can get. Um, I'm not sure what the APFS code is using internally or natively. Um, your best bet is to try to find that out and just use whatever system they use. Hmm? All right, well, if there's no more questions, uh, everybody enjoy James Dempsey's uh, send-off, which is next. Thanks.